so yeah, I'm just going to get into it then. And anthropologists often read their talks. I'm not going to read all of my talk, but I'm going to read a tiny bit for you just at the beginning. Um, so on an overcast day in the Bay Area, I was eating lunch with Mike, a longtime engineer at a personalized radio company. I had been living in San Francisco during my field work, visiting the offices of music recommendation companies and meeting up with engineers in bars and coffee shops. For the last decade, Mike has been responsible for his company's recommendation algorithm, the big knot of code that decides what song to play next. Uh, this decision, Mike told me, is pivotal to the business. Pick the wrong song and your users will leave. Pick the right song and they'll stick around. Over the years, uh, Mike's algorithm has changed. It used to simply take a seed artist and then play music by similar artists. But now the algorithm is an elaborate algorithmic system, bundling together dozens of sub-algorithms under a master algorithm. Uh, these sub-algorithms try to figure out what kind of listener you are, uh, and they adjust the recommendations accordingly. So maybe you're an adventurous listener, or maybe you're not. Uh, maybe you care mostly about genre, or maybe you care mostly about popularity. Uh, the master algorithm that blends these signals together is optimized for one thing above all else to keep listeners listening. So as you listen, and the system collects more data about you, the balance among sub-algorithms may shift. Uh, Mike told me, quote, depending on where you are in your lifetime of interaction and experience with us, you get very different music experiences. So for long-term users with lots of listening data, uh, the system can provide minutely personalized music choices that take into account years of listening history. But, Mike continued, if you're in your first week of listening to us, we're like, fuck that, play the hits. Play the shit you know they're going to love to get them coming back. Get them addicted. In the beginning, I'm just trying to get you hooked. Oh, yes, he said that. Uh, <laughs> hooked, it turned out, was also the title of a book by a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and blogger near Ayal, which is subtitled, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. And it draws on behavioral economics and cognitive psychology to teach software startups how to get users to crave their products, to instinctually check their apps as a matter of habit rather than conscious choice. Successful products, according to Ayal, uh, beat their competitors by making themselves first to mind. Users feel a pang of, wait, oh. Feel, feel a pang of loneliness, and before rational thought occurs, they're scrolling through their Facebook feeds. The purpose of the book, Ayal writes, is to teach not only what compels users to click, but what makes them tick. Okay, so that's the reading part. So I've spent the last several years doing ethnographic fieldwork with the developers of music recommendation systems, like the system that RDO advertises here that tunes music to you. you I'm sure you are all familiar with them. Sometimes I have to explain what Pandora in, and the ilk are, but the idea is they use algorithms to play music that they think you'll like. Um, the idea, uh, oh, so, sorry. So yeah, so this is what I've been doing for the past few years. I'm finishing my dissertation. I'm an anthropologist, and we'll get into sort of, uh, this is gonna be based on a little bit of what I've done, some of this research. And what's happened over the few years that I've been doing this research is that we've seen a shift in recommender systems work, both in companies like RDO and in the academic research community that builds recommender systems. This is the academic community that these systems came out of originally in the 90s, uh, and they're still fairly involved getting hired into these companies like Spotify, Pandora, RDO, et cetera. So what the shift is, is a shift from predictive accuracy to user retention. And so what it used to be, if you've heard of the Netflix prize, which is a prize that Netflix was going to give someone money if they Im improved the performance of their algorithm by 10%, I think it was. Um, and the metric that they used to figure out what 10% was, was this thing called root mean square error, or RMSE. And what that means basically is you can compare a big matrix of numbers to another big matrix of numbers and get a single number that tells you how similar they are to each other. And that's your error. Um, what those numbers are, are your ratings. So if you've used Netflix, you're familiar with, you know, we think you're going to like this four stars. Um, and if you do like it four stars, that's success. Um, if I say 3.5 stars, that's less success and so on. Um, that's a metric that comes out of the idea of recommender systems as a form of information retrieval. You're looking for the desirable um, movies and you want to find them. Uh, and if they give them to you, that's good. So what's happened is that people have said over time as they've used this metric uh, and done more user studies that Predictive accuracy is not enough. You don't increase user satisfaction beyond a certain amount if you get better at predicting things. And worse, for the engineers who love to tune these like, bits of algorithms, things in the UI, like changing the thing to say movies that we recommend for you as opposed to movies, those have a more marked effect on people's reported user satisfaction. So what we've seen is a move 
instead to user retention. This happens both academically, where you don't really care about users in a, in a sort of capitalist sense, but also obviously among companies like RDO and Spotify, where chief metrics are things like satisfaction, which gets measured by proxy um, as how long someone is on your system, um, dwell time, which is another word for you know how long you've spent watching movies, how long you've spent listening to music, um, and monthly active users and daily active users, which are sort of the perfect metrics for venture capitalists, as well as weirdly a proxy for how happy people are with your system. Um, and so what I'm gonna suggest is that, what this means is that these companies that build recommender systems are concerned primarily with what I'm gonna call uh, captivation. And this is a little reference to a sort of meme among the music tech companies. If you look at any music tech company website, for example, RDOs, uh, there is this thing where you have women listening to headphones and they touch them like that to know, let you know that they're listening to them. They look off into the distance or they close their eyes. Um, so, and so the goal is to be captivated. It's crazy. Girl, it's girl in headphones is what they call the people who feel like they've now identified this. And so these are just some of the stock photos. Um, so for reasons that will become clear, and may be clear already if you remember the title of the talk, I'm going to talk about this as captivation and say that captivation is something uh, that people interested in algorithms generally and in recommender systems in particular uh, should care about. So someone uh, said a while ago uh, that, there, <laughs> that there is a big uh, metaphor gap in how people describe algorithmic filtering. We don't know how to make sense of algorithmic filters. What kinds of things are they? And so I want to suggest that a useful metaphor for making sense of them is the trap. And the reason I think this is useful is not that recommender algorithms and other ones are traps and not anything else, but that the idea of traps helps provide some analytical purchase on what algorithms are doing, and they help direct our attention to useful features of them. So the algorithms may be other things, but among them, they are also traps. So especially, this is especially useful for talking about how the, so, the social and the technical come to be blended in them. And so when I say traps, I mean literally traps. Like these are traps. They are from the Pitt Rivers collection at Oxford, which looks like this. We are in deep anthropology territory. Um, so, so we are gonna take a detour through the anthropology of animal traps. Um, I am going to get you out of here, I promise, but it's going to seem a little bit not related to computers for a while. So traps, uh, <laughs> traps are amazing. They're this, these little bits of sort of technical ingenuity and bricolage. Uh, they're hidden in environments. You find them all around the world. These traps are from all over the world. Uh, people at Oxford, these are usually replicas because when you make traps and put them into the environment, they tend to disintegrate. You can imagine these materials don't play very well, like when you have to put them under water uh, and, they, and they vanish. Uh, they seem very different from algorithms, right, which are supposed to be essentially immaterial, logic-y, process -y things. So I'm going to try to explain why I think algorithms have a lot to do uh, with these kinds of things, or to like stab you in the leg or catch you in a net. Okay, so the bit of analytical purchase that I want to bring to bear on this is from an article uh, by the late uh, British anthropologist of art, Alfred Gell, who has this great article, which I recommend you all to read, about traps as artworks and artworks as traps. And the premise is that in the philosophy of art, there had been a tendency to distinguish between art, which is this fancy thing, and mere artifacts, which are ordinary stuff. And the question is, how do you justify this kind of distinction? And he wanted to suggest that uh, traps were a kind of uh, physical artifact that you could justify as being like artworks for a variety of very elaborate reasons, which he outlines in excruciating Percy and semiotic detail. You can find the book if you want. I'm just going to take some key points here uh, that are going to be useful for thinking about traps, and hopefully you can just apply these. Oh, and I didn't say this before, but this is just a tool to think with, so if you're interested in giving me feedback on this, let me know if you think this applies to anything you're thinking of or if you think that it just like is an insane thing and you should never talk about it again. Okay, so Alfred Gell says, traps can be regarded as texts on animal behavior written by the people who designed them. So this trap is designed to catch a bird that pecks at the ground. This trap is designed to catch uh, someone who likes donuts. Uh, this floor pie uh, is designed to catch someone who likes pie and doesn't care where it comes from. Um, this fish trap is designed to catch fish that like to swim upstream. So it's always just fun to talk about how they work. So the fish goes in, eats the thing here, breaks the string, and then this goes and flings the fish up out of the water. Traps like this are sometimes called the trap that turns fish into fruit because now all of a sudden the fish are hanging off of this stick as though they're sort of fruit on a tree. Um, 
He points out that traps communicate the, ne the, uh, the idea of a nexus of intentionalities between hunters and prey animals via material forms and mechanisms. So they're the conjuncture of a relationship between two different entities, the hunter and the hunted, the prey and the predator, or in our case, the sort of set of engineers working in an office around here somewhere and the users out there in the world. So uh, what this means is that we can read traps as a kind of hunting story. So he says, not designed to communicate or to function as a sign, and in fact designed to be hidden, uh, the trap nonetheless signifies far more intensely than most signs intended as such. The static violence of the tensed bow, the congealed malevolence of the arrangement of sticks and cords are revelatory in themselves, right? So you can see here is a, an arrow trap where if you would run past this, you would get shot uh, with an arrow. And so there's this amazing intensity that you can read out of traps. There's wonderful vividness in the materiality of it, and I find it very useful to resort to material metaphors. This is related to my earlier work on the player piano, to make sense of contemporary things that feel very immaterial, and so it's hard to get a grip on them. So saying, you know what, I think your recommender system is like this bow and arrow stick thing, that's very useful to me. Um, so we could borrow a term from feminist science studies and say they're sort of material semiotic bundles. They're both action-making technologies and they're signifying. So you can read a whole story out of this about people and the animals they're trying to get. Um, or in this case, for example, this trap catches antelope that like to run quickly between, between trees. Uh, these devices embody ideas and convey meanings because a trap, by its very nature, is a transformed representation of its maker, the hunter, and the prey, animal, its victim, and of their mutual relationship, which among hunting people is a complex, quintessentially social one. Um, so you may question whether humans and antelope can have social relations, but I hope that in the context of engineering, it's clear that the humans who make recommender systems and the humans that use them could, all, could have social relations. Uh, and then he closes by saying, traps are lethal parodies of the animal's umwelt. So he writes, thus the rat that likes to poke around in narrow spaces has just such an attractive cavity prepared for its last fateful foray into the dark. And if you're not familiar with the word umwelt, this is your sort of perceptual environment, what the environment is in relationship to how you perceive the world. So traps, we can think of in general, uh, as a kind of constructed environment, which is keyed to specific affordances uh, and the ideas that the makers of the traps have about how the things they're trying to trap perceive. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about this. So the point, Gell's argument for likening traps to art is that they're both technologies of captivation. So here's an illustration of Damien Hirst's, uh, what is the name of this thing? It's got one of those horrible big names. The name of a, with the, the impossibility of death in the mind of someone living, I think, is the, in any case, it's a big shark in a tank. And you can see two different things captivated here, right? The man looking at the shark and the shark itself. Um, and the point is to recover the ambiguity between two definitions of the word captivation. Mental captivation, and physical captivation. So we might say it's okay for a musician to captivate uh, their audience mentally, but not physically, right? So the idea is to re recover the ambigu am ambiguous space in between there so we can think about captivation as a sort of general social process. Um, so now let's say, what does this have to do with recommender systems? Uh, so out of how recommender systems are designed, we can read ideas about uh, what users are like. So this is from a Microsoft patent for an emotion-based music recommender. And in my field work, I often heard people say, you know, oh, mu people like the music that they like because of the emotions that they have about it. So here is, you know, a system that has a built-in emotion vocabulary. It will find emotions in websites. It will do this emotional allocation modeling, which is what this patent is for. And then after matching it to you, we'll give you recommender results. Um, this interplay of intentionalities is even tighter. This is uh, from Netflix, so you can see uh, the way that they test their models and feedback. So what this, this sort of nexus interplay thing that's happening happens even more tightly. You have this constant feedback loop that happens before you uh, roll things out. Um, and on the malevolent materials front, um, biosensors that produce a life index identifier, which can then be correlated with certain music tastes. So, you know, if you're going to go for a run, uh, you will get a different music recommended to you uh, than if you are sitting at your desk or about to die or sad or all, you know, the few, th horny, the few things that these biosensors can actually, uh, can actually detect. Um, the systems are social uh, in the sense I mentioned before of humans working, doing things for humans, but also that the people who create these traps are in intricate social relations with each other. Um, so algorithms, contrary to what a lot of people critically talk about them, are not isolated bits of autonomous agency, but are rather tangles of agency, a kind of collaborative socio-technicality uh, that doesn't care whether data sources or processes are, human, are humans or machines. So that the point is not to say, oh, now this has all been pushed into the machine, but rather that what we have is a sort of tangle of humans and machines. Uh, 
little for the Heideggerians in the room, uh, traps or lethal parodies of animals' umwelt. So yes, caring about dwell time uh, brings into mind the way that these things produce environments. Um, and as they concern themselves primarily with context now, trying to figure out what music you like based on the context you're in, um, they're, con they're simultaneously reconstructing these contexts and modulating them. Um, and this happens in a sort of Deleuze sense, which we can talk about in the Q&A if people really want to talk about Deleuze. Okay, so the other thing that, tra that traps do that is useful uh, is they center this question of ethics. And this is sort of the last bit here. Um, so we tend to think about captivation as a negative thing. I've had people respond to like bits of this talk by saying you shouldn't use the word traps. People don't like the idea that they're building traps to trap other people. Um, but I think that centering traps is very useful because it does make us think about what are the ethics of trapping. And it's not that traps are necessarily bad. Rather, that traps are objects in the world that do things. And you wouldn't critique a trap, say a rat trap like we saw before, for being incorrect, right? So people tend to critique recommender systems for being wrong, that they do, they're not accurate, right? So like, oh, Netflix doesn't understand me, it recommends movies badly. Uh, Pand every time I talk to someone, they say, Pandora doesn't really get my taste. If only they did this other thing, they would get my taste. And so the point of this is that you can move the critical mode away from, can we make this like mirror image of the world better? And more towards, well, we know this is not the world, this is an image of the world, this is a machine that's supposed to do things in the world, uh, and let's talk about whether it's okay to be captivating these people, how power gets into play in these systems of captivation, uh, and the like. Um, so a sort of nice model for this uh, is this book, Addiction by Design, by Natasha Shul, about the design of, uh, of slot machines. Um, so Shul gives us this great model for thinking of this weird middle ground between mental and physical captivation, right, and how they get inflected by power and capital and all of these sorts of things. Um, she quotes a bunch of people who are machine gambling addicts. Um, she says, something sinister was at work here, enticing normal people uh, into a snare. And one of her informants says, when I gamble, I feel like a rat in a trap. And so the ability of some of these machines to actively captivate people uh, can, in the case of slot machines, be problematic, although arguably in the case of music, it's you know, fairly innocuous. Um, but the idea, nonetheless, is that we can focus on how, on how captivation works. Um, so captivation may sound like it's uniformly bad, I've gotten this a lot, um, but Gell and I would suggest that it's basically a general operation of sociality. So like people often try to captivate each other in conversation. I've been trying to captivate you right now and so on. So, but now I'm gonna let you go so that we can have a, a more mutual conversation. Thanks. <laughs> Questions, yeah. I know you know this paper really well, so I'm, I'm asking you like, a jump from this idea of the trap to the idea of the sieve and how algorithms function as sieves. And what is the relationship between the trapping metaphor and the sieve metaphor that also comes going through mathematics and from anthropology? Right. Um, that's a great question, and I probably should have thought of that. So sieves are another wonderful material metaphor for thinking about this, and I think Kate's probably referring to this great paper in the journal How by Paul Cockleman, which is about a sort of Bayesian anthropology talking about, about sieving as a generic operation of sense making. Um, it's another Persian semiotic thing, so I probably should uh, make this connection more explicit. Um, and to spare you from just listening to me try to riff on it, because I don't think I've got something. Uh, there's definitely something there, right? And there's a sense in which a lot of these traps are filters for their environment, especially say if you look at like fish traps, which are often literally, you know, a net of a particular size that catches anything too big to go through it. Um, that's a really interesting question to me is how these are sort of processors on, on their environments. Um, there's a whole other lobe to this, which is talking about environments per se. So people who make these systems describing themselves as park rangers and gardeners and all of these sort of uh, pastoral metaphors. Um, which makes a lot of sense if you think about traps as being a kind of environment that people build to captivate people. Um, there is a sort of self-understanding uh, that's related to this, but I haven't got there yet. It's be very theoretically sophisticated. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm just, this is really just as a, as a provocation for where you can take this paper, because I think there's a, I was thinking of the paper by Carl on the table two sieves, mm. looking at different algorithms around how we think about the process of detecting what's important from a large data set. And it seems to me that by going down this, this much more more granular path, you can actually look at different 
types of algorithms, but different kinds of algorithms. Right. So I think there are trapping algorithms, I think there are also suiting algorithms, and this actually becomes a different kind of taxonomy of how we think about the algorithmic. So I think they're connected, but I think yeah. there are different algorithmic spaces that work more with some. I guess what I would say actually is that so if you talk to like a person in the sort of day-to-day -day work of building this, of building algorithmic systems like this, everyone's working on their random bit, right? So someone at one point might just be working on a system for trying to identify a genre. And that's not necessarily in and of itself a trap per se, right? But the way that that system gets evaluated and how it gets plugged into everything else is as part of a trap. So you can imagine what these traps really look like is sort of these Rube Goldberg machines of like, oh, well, there's a little net bit over here and there's a part over here. I mean, that one that was at the beginning of like a bunch of rocks with a net on it, and so it's like a bird. So, there, so it's sort of like that, right? I think of traps as being ultimately these get dedicated towards are we keeping people around purposes, but certainly from moment to moment, they're not necessarily saying, ah, yes, this is only for captivation. This is for knowledge. This is for sorting and so on. Dana. This, the last statement that you just made sort of gets me where I want to go with this, which is that <clears throat> to what degree can we think about that metaphor in light of how power is enacted and made visible to the actors who are involved in it? For example, when you talk about hunting, the very process of trapping is to create something in order to see if it was successful by having going and seeing that there is an animal or whatever you were seeking to, to trap in it. Um, and that whole process is made visible in ways that actually brings to your ethics question, right? Which is that there is something where you, if you see an animal who has been captured and is still alive or is wholly dead, it's one thing, versus some animal that is suffering and brings on a different conversation about what right. um, that looks like. So let's pull this into this highly distributed process of creating what you're arguing are digital traps. To what degree can we think of the people as making the processes visible or not, right? What are all of these mechanisms? Right. Which comes back to that notion of successful. And then also ethically, what does it mean to leave somebody in limbo, maimed and, you know, right. and, and twitching? Like, what, what is that, where does that conceptual bit get to us? <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, so, <laughs> well, the visibility question is, is great and right on, I think, because the interesting point of these traps right, is that the, the pictures that I was showing you are not them in their environments, and when they are in their environments, they're hidden, right? The whole point of them is to be hidden, and I this mean, is part of the visibility of, of whether or not the object um, uh, succeeds in doing its thing. You, you, you were able to see the, your success as power. Got it. Um, so, so, yeah, so obviously, you know, power and visibility are, are tightly linked, and so on the one hand, they operate as power because they can be hidden. Uh, on the other hand, you, your ab ability to see whether someone has been trapped or not is also uh, usually unevenly distributed in these, in these kinds of systems, right? So if you think about machine, it's easier to think about it in terms of these things that seem more dire, so I apologize for how sort of dark the metaphors get, but like, uh, you know, think about machine gambling, for example. It's very possible for the people who run those systems to see whether someone has been rolled into an addictive behavior. Uh, with their with their systems, and I'm not suggesting that the risk of music recommendations is that you'll get addicted to Pandora and be like, you know, whatever. Um, but the point is, is that visibility is unevenly distributed, and there's something Gell talks about this in the context of traps, especially because they're even more about the power of the hunter. Because when you're hunting in a sort of active sense, you're you know you yourself are in play. In the case of the trap, you've delegated your agency. You are, he says, as God in the sense that you've got your system out here, and nobody knows anything has happened until you've trapped the animal. Um, the fun thing about working with this kind of metaphor is that uh, you get to sort of run it along for traps, and then you say, wait a minute, hold on, I'm not talking about algorithms anymore, and go back to algorithms and see what works, you know, what you can pull across. Um, and I'm not entirely sure where that goes in the context of, of algorithmic systems. So for me, what, what I've used this for primarily is to direct attention to how important it is to understand user imaginaries. So the idea is that if these are texts on animal behavior, they're very informed by what you think users are like. And the dominant idea about what users are like uh, in these worlds that I've been that I've been in for the last few years uh, is that users are distinguished by how avidly they like or pursue music. And the point of a recommender system is to get someone who is not very avid about music to listen, right? So you don't care that much. You don't want to do anything to put it on. So this, so what ends up happening is that because you don't like you don't care about music that much, you're not willing to put in a lot of effort into finding it. Uh, and therefore, what the trap has to do is collect a lot of other signals from you instead. And so what you get are the, actually, maybe I can find them. 
here. Uh, so this is a pyramid that goes around the music tech world. This is the different kind of listeners. Savants are really enthusiastic about music. They're hipsters. They're whatever. And indifference are people who really don't give a shit. They call them Starbucks listeners sometimes because they would buy whatever is on the counter at Starbucks and just like listen to that. This is different now that like what's on the counter at Starbucks has changed over time. But um, the idea is like, how do you catch these people? Well, they're not going to give you anything. So you need to collect as much as you can from them. And so the argument is that if your data collection technique uh, relies on this thought of your users being unavid, being indifferent, that is going to justify building a very expansive trap that's going to do collect all sorts of wacky extra data that you don't necessarily need, maybe a concern of people here. Um, and so now you have this system for just like hoovering up any data you can, because maybe you can correlate it with something else. But if you didn't think of your users as indifferent, you might build a different kind of trap. And so what I would suggest is if you wanted to intervene in this kind of space and say stop, like, stop the data collection, a good spot to do it is to do it in this moment of user imagination. And to say, reimagine your users and you will build different traps for them. And trapping is not necessarily bad, it's just you know, a mechanism. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's great. I like that. The, the sort of the, the bidirectionality of, of the trap as a metaphor, I think, is, is important to understanding sort of to why, why I think it does a little bit more work than just filtering and like liter a literal filter then as the thing. But obviously, you can sort of think of these in any way you might want to. Um, there are other questions. Karen? Yeah, so maybe the thing to do is to talk a little bit about environments then. And so the idea is that, um, so the, the line is from the former head of Google Music, Tim Quirk, and he talks, tries to figure out like, what are we? We being these like digital intermediaries who make these, you know, these systems, it's like they make Spotify as a whole system, right? Um, and he says, we're not gatekeepers, referring to sort of A&R guys who would have like decided who could have a record deal or not. And we're not tastemakers, we're not like DJs or the guy at the record store who like helps you figure out what's cool. Uh, he says, we're park rangers. And then he goes on and on, and it's, it's an extraordinary gift to me, because he's just like, so what do park rangers do? Well, we maintain the paths in the park between things that you might like, and you might like the path. So you know, you like this song, oh, there's a path that goes all the way to the other song. And like park rangers, we the, we the like music intermediaries, maybe we like the obscure paths better than the well-trod paths. And then he says, uh, so basically you're in this open area uh, and you're walking down the paths and you feel like you can do whatever you want, but our hand is there subtly on your back guiding you. He says all of this. <laughs> and so you can't, like there's not really a better illustration of like Deleuze's like control society than that, which is it looks like you can do anything you want in this great park, but there's some creepy guy and his hand is in the small of your back and you're like, and you're moving around in places you don't want to go. Um, and so to really expand on that idea of, uh, where are you? <laughs> of the sort of trap as, as Umwelt, there we go, um, is that like, 
in that sense that the inside of a rat trap is like a place rats like to be. Uh, humans like to be in expansive open places, right? So the human trap is a little bit more complicated because it's not just like an isolated thing that's in an environment. It itself is starting to constitute its own like m big environment such that you don't even look like you're in something. Um, and what's interesting about that to me is that the people who make these systems tend to think of themselves as dealing with unruly wilderness, right? Like they talk about their incoming data sources as just like crazy and just like, you know, this is like, uh, you know, the, the great outdoors and we're trying to make it manageable. But for people who use them and for people who are critical of them, they seem a little bit more like, you know, the, an English garden or something like that, which is like an artificial kind of, of naturalness. Um, so I think that it still is in play this question of like, are we dealing with what's innately there? And there's another talk about this, which is, you know, we're just dealing about this, this question of, are we inventing this or are we discovering it, right? This basic like STS question. Um, and the way that the people that I've talked to deal with that issue is rather than taking one side or the other, we would expect them to be like, no, we're discovering it. It's objective, it's out there. I'm an engineer, I think rationally. Instead, they work in this middle space of agriculture and, and the pastoral, which is this funky, like, it's not quite nature, it's not quite culture, it's not quite technology, um, but it's sort of in the middle of all three. Martha. I have a question about the word lethal. Yes. Is that the question? Yeah. <laughs> so we, we, had, we had this moment earlier where we got to talk about the interesting difference between music recommendation algorithms, which don't seem like a terribly big deal or like a serious thing, and more obviously serious ones, which this is actually a good thing to crowdsource. Uh, we, we call it loans and drones. And we need a word that rhymes with loans and drones for police and, uh, and you know, uh, predictive policing. But the point being that this is not lethal, right? Like these systems are not killing anyone, but there are algorithmic systems that do kill people. Um, and so yes, uh, in the case of music, I think this is kind of an overstatement, but this lethality and this really negative uh, association, I think helps us find some of the common ground across different algorithmic systems such that things that we can learn in the context of music recommendation where the stakes are lower and people are more willing to go out there and say crazy stuff um, might then be pulled back across to say, okay, other forms of profiling that are more obviously about trapping and killing, um, what can we learn about them? Which again, re resort to things about like texts on quote unquote animal or in this case, human behavior. Um, again, you want to intervene in the user imaginaries, but in this case, they're not users um, and all that sort of stuff. But yes, Sarah, topic. go ahead. So um, I was kind of curious to hear more about that shift between the predictive, predictive ac accuracy and the user retention, because I think part of this, if there is a lethality in this, it's about um, kind of exploitation. Right. And you know, the capitalistic, like, once we've got you, you're going to keep renewing your monthly subscription. Right. So is there, can you say more about that? algorithmic shift and how they're intending to build these systems. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting move, right? So a lot of things that sound really good to social scientific critics on the outsides of these systems, uh, when they happen or something that's like them happens in these systems, they seem very bad and like, wait, that's not what we meant. So for example, uh, when people say, oh, these systems don't care enough about context. They don't appreciate the rich contextuality of human life. Okay, so let's care about context. This is a context how your heartbeat works. We're gonna put biometric sensors into your environment. Uh, you know, th this is a context. Uh, we're going to try and like, and like grab signals from around you. We're gonna collect ever more data. Um, and so once they start to do the thing we want them to do, then it's like, wait a minute, no, 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 we meant something else by that. And this is a problem that is sensitive to anthropologists because we really care a lot about context. And then it's like, wait, you're doing your context wrong. What does that even mean? Oh my God, we don't disagree about context about whether it's good to decontextualize because you're not gonna find anyone who says, yeah, that's a good idea. We disagree about what context is. Uh, and so in this case of user satisfaction, it's a similar thing, right? So nominally the move from predictive accuracy to user-centered metrics, like how satisfied are the people using this system is good. But when it happens, the proxies that come to stand in for user satisfaction move you into a whole other world of stuff. They're not necessarily bad. I'm not saying that it's horrible for these systems to like get people to listen to music all the time. Um, but what you've got is this, what looks like nominally like a wholly good shift to like a user-centered thing, which again becomes something else. And so maybe the question is for us, sort of speaking broadly as outsider critics, to think about what the terms of our critique actually mean, right? So when we say you should care about context, you should care about the user, uh, they do, 
then the question is sort of how, you know. Anthony. not being, you know, really well steeped in kind of the, the like disciplinary approach that you're taking to it, just two like general um, observations that might be worth thinking about um, as we go forward. So the first, and I think this came up a little bit, but I just want to make it really clear, um, like the vast majority of algorithmic traps that get sprung in the world around us, we never know they're sprung, right? Mm. And that's like sort of one of the fundamental points I think you're trying to make that like you know, the power becomes visible when a trap is sprung. Um, we're probably setting them off all around us right now. We don't even know about it. Uh, and that's sort of the nature of, like, a fundamental piece of their power um, and what's freaking people out about them right now. Um, and then the other thing is, um, like, these music recommendation systems provide, like, a lot of benefits to the people that set them off, right? The traps. Like, the traps in the anthropological sense can never provide any benefit. Right. Other than that little titillation they provide, like right you know, before, there, right before you, you know, you become someone's dinner. So, right. Um, I don't know how you deal with that fact that they actually like your spectrum isn't just from like inconvenience to lethality. It's like extreme pleasure to you know total neutral right. to inconvenience to lethality. Like it's a much bigger cost benefit kind of spectrum. Yeah, so I think that that's a good point. I think that's basically sort of the limit of the metaphor, right, is that traps are, uh, well, so traps are fundamentally temporal, right? It's hard to express how a trap really works by just like seeing a picture of it because they do, there's a process that happens like very quickly, but they're kind of a punctuating thing, right? It's just like, and now the trap has happened and the trapping has happened. Um, but what these are is something more expansive, right? So what you take is sort of that internal world of the trap, which is this, uh, which is this sort of lethal parody of the umwelt, and expand it such that you can sort of survive in there for a while. You can hang out, you could, but you can't really leave because you don't really understand the terrain. You're sort of like in the Truman Show or something, right? You're like in this thing, you don't know you've been trapped. Um, but there's not, I don't think there's a lot of, of benefit and over, having overextended the traps metaphor plenty, I don't think there's much benefit in extending it any further necessarily to that. And so at that point, it becomes more useful to talk about what I think of as the construction of environments and thus environments that people can continue to live in rather than in being instantaneously murdered. I mean, the one interesting thing, if you do want to just bring it to death. Yeah, like let's do it. The whole <laughs> world of like countermeasures and, you know, like animals are very good at stealing bait without triggering traps, right? Oh, interesting. I'm sure there's a whole sociology of hunters around around that, right? Like, uh, and, and I'm sure yeah. more bait gets taken without anything getting caught than gets trapped along with, with a kill. You can you know? think about like... Uh, the majority of bait gets eaten without everything, anything ever getting caught. So you could think about like interesting, yeah, countermeasures, I'm thinking of like Helen Nissenbaum's like obfuscation stuff and things like that is like, imagine now putting yourself in the position of one of these animals that might be trapped, what would you do to try and like, you know, not get trapped while still getting the thing? That's an interesting way to do it. I just like the, the vividness of it I find very useful. <laughs> yeah. So my question comes as an anecdote uh, from a white cusp. And uh, from my classmates was telling me that he was searching for something on Google, a Python question on Google, and suddenly the entire search page opened up into a console, which became a quasi-job interview where Google challenged my classmate with a bunch of questions and and he was supposed to pass levels and when, when he reached level four, they said, and if, uh, an interviewer is going to contact you because you seem to have the chops to be one of us. Whoa. This happened like ish, a couple of days back. And so when he told me, it was like, this, this is exactly what happened to him and this is something that's happening right now. And it just, <laughs> That? He was just randomly like, you know, he was writing some code to solve something, <laughs> like he was doing homework, and he was typing Python on something, and then just the entire search page just opened up into this console thing, to welcome to your That is... <laughs> but it, but it, it, you know, and then just a bunch of red flags just started going up, and like, one, why wasn't I selected for that track? <laughs> <laughs> You want to get, everyone wants into that trap, but you can't. And, and but, but on the other side, it's almost like it changed my response to Google because there's this love-hate relationship with Google. Is that they've used 
what I thought was an innocent search behavior for their own kind of good, but to also to target that person as a potential employee from Google. Right. And so, I mean, I'd just like to know what your reactions are. That is really interesting. The, the only thing I can think of that's sort of just a related anecdote is in this behavioral economics sort of ascendant thing, um, Dan, Dan Ariely, who has, uh, who has, he has now a conference for startups to help them apply behavioral economics principles to their businesses. Um, one of the big focus areas of that conference is not just getting users, but keeping your employees around. And so the idea that you might also be, you know, sort of, this is like recursively forever trapping, that like the people who are trying to trap you have been themselves trapped. This is where it starts to extend into weird spaces, which makes sense in the like Persian semiotic framework of which it is born, which is like, of course it can extend forever. Captivation is a general social operation. And so like everyone is trying to sort of captivate each other in different ways. This is how agency interplays and traps are just a sort of materialization of that. Um, same with artworks and, and other sorts of things, our weird job interview website cyber portals. Um, but yeah, that, thank you, that was, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, really great talk. Um, I think it, it rings true for a lot of um, recommendation systems. But I was wondering if you thought about, there's a, it seems like there's another approach which, which some companies are pursuing. And certainly, from my experience in the UK, the UK government have uh, online services, and their their philosophy, their user experience, um, sort of um, I, their sort of ideal user experience is one that gets out of the way as soon as possible, right. and is the most efficient process from the user having a need to having fulfilled that need. Sure. And that might be for a recommendation; it might be something else. Um, and there's also someone called Kathy Sierra, who's a yeah. user experience kind of guru. Right. And her her approach is very similar. And so it's, there's a, a whole different paradigm of uh, don't trap the user, get the user through the process as quickly as possible. Right. And that kind of reminds me of the old sort of approach to automation, which is take a process that is, uh, takes a long time, takes a lot of human sort of, um, time to get through it, and make it as quick as possible. Um, and I kind of think, in some cases, the, the, the trap is sort of with music recommendations. What's being trapped is something that might, so it might have music on for a fixed amount of time per day, right. and that's kind of fixed. It's not actually taking up more resources than we right. would otherwise have done. So I kind of feel like in some cases the trap is quite a nice thing if it's not taking up more of your time. And then in other cases there is this trend towards um, just the most efficient processes that take the least amount of user time. Sure. So yeah, so at the, on that last, but there is pleasure and captivation, right, which sort of goes to Anthony's point. And if you are really people have tried to make me do this. If you were really like Lacanian or something about it, you'd be like, of course there's pleasure in captivation and self-annihilation or whatever. We don't have to go there. Um, but the, uh, <laughs> this, this, this question about sort of smooth user experiences, um, this captivation stuff is kind of an update of what people used to call stickiness, uh, and they don't so much call it stickiness anymore, around websites, right? And so the, I, this is a, an old dead slide from this talk, is that uh, the stickiness factor as like a thing that people in businesses care about. That's a Malcolm Gladwellism uh, and the, out of the tipping point. And that comes out of the tipping point comes out the same year that another anthropologist, uh, Danny Miller, who you may be familiar with, anthropologist of the internet and materiality, has an article that does a sort of similar thing to what I've done here, but just about uh, websites. So he talks about websites in Trinidad and people trying to captivate their like sort of audience by making you know cool scrolling graphics. And so this is like the Trinidadian web circa 1997 or something like that. Um, so yeah, I think that what this is is an update of, of stickiness. And one of the responses might be to do you know a sort of Henry Jenkins style like spreadability or anything that's like you know what's the opposite of stickiness. I personally prefer to think of just captivation as something that's what people do and it's not a terribly big deal if it doesn't have to be. Um, but yeah, that's a great point. Madeline? I have a question about I'm digging into the anthropology of traps and sort of what else yeah, let you go there. Thank you. Um, kind of what else beyond Gelt stuff you've been looking into? I mean one thing it's it's been brought up in some of the comments, but I think what's so interesting about why traps work is is the sort of asymmetry between frames of meaning. Like the traps work because the animal that is meant to be trapped, um, there's the sort of the significant frame of action is missing. That is to say, like the trap wouldn't catch a human because the human would see that it's a trap because right. what becomes like a significant action.
interaction, the human, humans share that, right? But the animals don't share that, so they don't see the significance. And so that kind of loops, I, so I sort of have two branching questions. Um, one is how do anthropology of traps and hunters deal sort of more with how animals frame their right. frame meaning in a way, and then also um, going in the other direction, I guess, how does, I forgot to say you have my question, but it was sort That's of okay. like mixed down. Um, yeah, so there is the, the most interesting anthropology of traps, to my mind, but by far is certainly this. Um, what, what things have looked like before is a sort of cataloging, you know, like find them, catalog them by their methods. Actually, you can look in, this is not anthropology, but you can look in the like patents database. Like if you search for patents on Google, there's like a separate category of patent that's for traps and you can see like the different mechanisms in them. And I've sort of entertained the idea of going in there and trying to imagine what analogs would be for each of the, you know, ones that explode, ones that shoot something with a gun, ones that stab them, this kind of stuff. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is maybe I should just tell a little story, which is from um, so anthropologist of religion, uh, Pascal Boyer. So this is a, a citation that sort of comes v through Gell to me, um, who does fieldwork on, who has done fieldwork on religion in Cameroon. And he, so he's talking to a chanter, uh, a Fong chanter, about uh, myth. So they care a lot about myth in the sense of, you know, like uh, wisdom that people repeat ritually. And he tells a story about, um, about chimpanzees and what chimpanzees are like. So this is about sort of how animals interpret, interpret their traps. And the trick is that to catch a chimpanzee, chimpanzees are smart like humans. Uh, and so you cannot catch a chimpanzee with a trap that looks like that. Because this requires you to be dumb, like an antelope, you have to just run through the thing and then freak out and tangle yourself more in the thing. And chimpanzees don't do that. And so what happens is that chimpanzees, uh, to catch chimpanzees, what they do, uh, this is this Cameroonian chanter is talking about what pygmies do out in the bush because he spent a lot of time with pygmies. These are funny anthropology stories, how these work. Um, the idea is that you have a string, a very loose string, and, the, and it catches on a chimpanzee. And what the chimpanzee does is, because they're curious animals like humans, it looks at the string, it stops. So it doesn't keep running. So you can't catch it with like a noose. Um, and it looks. And so what happens is it looks and it pulls on it to see what's going on. And as soon as it pulls on it, then the big bundle with the poison spear on it falls down on top of the chimpanzee. So you can only catch them through this thing that's been tailored exactly to sort of their intelligence. Um, and the idea being sort of communicated there is that myth is a similar thing, that myth and wisdom is this idea of you need to like trap people through their curiosity. Um, the point being that if you imagine animals as being dumb or smart, you're going to build different, build different things. Martha. Okay, so this is not a descriptive metaphor. You're not actually saying that algorithms are like traps. What you're saying is that analysts need to analyze algorithms in the way that anthropologists analyze traps. It's a methodological metaphor. Yes. I think I, what I would suggest is that I'm inclined to think of all metaphors in that latter way. So the point isn't that they're traps to the exclusion of something else, but that thinking about them as traps raises up certain qualities in the same way that, say, you could argue that these are media, you could argue that they are technology, you could argue that they're communication, you could argue that they're art, and none of those things need to be mutually exclusive. But by looking at them as one thing or as another thing, different features will come into, into view. So my point here is that traps are, are, I think, an interesting way to look at something as, uh, not necessarily to say, oh, yes, these are definitely traps. What you're doing is trapping, and that's the be-all and end-all, and you know, don't do that. post-war military technology, pre-communicative. Pre it's not, a media, it's, it's, it's not a networked mediating technology. Sure. So it doesn't have some of the key features that algorithms have. Such as their network nature, or? Such as the ongoing communicative recursive aspect. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Such as? The biopolitical, the sustenance is about sustenance of life. It's not about lethality. Right. And then the economic component isn't there either, because you're not in the market. A trap is not a market object. It's a pre-market object. I think well, the biopolitics point I think is a great one, which I haven't really thought of. Um, and yes. I, because I've been trying to figure out why, why you've gone to this thing. Right. And if I go the genealogy route, then I'm critiquing what you're doing. 
But yeah. if I just understand that what you're doing is instructively telling me that it's more useful to look at algorithms in the way that we read, just as Gal reads the trap as a text, right. let's try to read the algorithm and have the components, and I can understand what, what Sure. Um, yeah, no, I think that's right. I think that, and it's actually a good pointing out of the limits, right, is that we don't have the biopolitical necess necessarily, although I think as you move into the cr production of environments that you do start to have something like the biopolitical. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's definitely like an analyst's, an analyst's metaphor. Um, and there was some other point in there that I had, but we'll have to follow up on that. Is there something about like skill and kind of passing it down the technique though? Like you know, it is pretty cultural, pretty economic. There's I mean it's certainly embedded in all sorts of systems that do still exist, you know, and that aren't quite as novel as say like post war networked computing or anything like that. Um, and skill is certainly one of them. There's a lot of stuff about skill related to these that we could talk about. Um, the ways that people build traps often happens in a sort of ritual format. There's a whole other thing about eel traps that I'm not going to subject you to now, um, which, <laughs> which calls on the same thing. Um, but yeah, so, but thank you. I think that the, those are very good limits, right? So where it's, I think it's interesting to see where do they diverge and the fact, like the limitations now also become a sort of analytical tool, right? Like, oh, this doesn't capture the like, speedy recursivity of what's going on here. Although I do think that the sort of nexus of intentionalities idea is only intensified by that and is not necessarily a complete qualitative change in form. We could argue about that though because I wouldn't stick to it necessarily. Dana. So I keep going back to the legal component. Um, and part of where I keep coming to it is that the work of, I mean, if we're talking about the work of the trap to kill an animal, but part of it is, is what are the cultural uh, implications of a decision to trap, if you will, uh, individuals? Because part of, I think about this in terms of what music did when we all were um, forced into radio stations as they became more clear channelified, sure. right? Which is that it used to be the idea of a DJ would try to understand the local context and think about what they would uh, play next. They were thinking about it in terms of the relationality between the different music, the relationality of the community, the relationality of their, um, of their station, and of course, their own position within it. And as we moved towards the requirement that they play the next song that was listed for them based on a whole set of other commercial interests, sure. Um, we ended up in a Britney Spears hell zone. Um, so Britney Spears hell zone. What I'm curious about is that a lot of why I see people drawn to these um, algorithmically produced experiences is in the hopes of getting, they're responding to that Britney Spears hell zone, where they're hoping to get out of that. They're hoping to right. be exposed to things. They're hoping to get back to a particular construct of the DJ. Sure. Um, a, a DJ who now is an algorithm rather than a, a you know, conceptualized being. And I'm trying to think through what are the consequences of one algorithm to rule them all, right? Which is effectively what you've said for a lot of these different components. One algorithm that is working across different layers of people but is effectively doing the same cultural work on all of the actors that are at play. And right. so therefore, how do we then take that lethality notion and say, what is the lethality to culture that comes oh, through that? Okay. Um, yeah, so there's, there's sort of two points here. One is that, like you mentioned, um, well, so it's not quite, uh, come on, are we there? No, oh, oh, it's gonna go, okay. Uh, we're not quite one algorithm to rule them all, except in the sense that there is like this, often, you know, in this sort of rangy algorithmic system, everything ultimately is gonna get parsed through something. But what people are really concerned with is that listeners are different across these levels and that people who make the systems tend to live up here and that the bulk of the potential users are down here. And so there's sort of, we have to disambiguate this a little bit and that one of the points is that, uh, is this shift to fuck that, play the hits, right? Which I mentioned at the beginning, which is that a lot of these systems, in spite of emerging from a place of like, we wanna help you get down the long tail, we wanna help you like get out of corporate monoculture, they're realizing that as soon as you move your metric to success, there's uh, well, there are a variety of reasons why popular things are popular, but you're going to be successful if you play popular things more than other things, right? And so while that does perform that back into existence, they are in a certain sense responding to, uh, to a, sort of, a sort of fact out there that they see when they try to run this stuff. And you know, you give someone 
obscure things, they'll talk about stuff like, oh, you made a playlist with whatever popular artist seed, you really ought to be listening to this other thing. So we're gonna, like, they don't do it, but they'll say, we wish that we could like recommend you other stuff to help like bring you up, like to elevate you, right? And this simultaneously can sound good to outsiders, like get them out of the corporate monoculture and also bad, which is like, what are you doing on this like civilizing mission? Like that's not your role and so on. Um, so, the people do deeply care about that and they do try to target them differently, but I, they tend to think that that targeting needs to happen on a program by program basis, right? So like Pandora, for example, works down here and something like say the Hype Machine works up here. Hype Machine is like a MP3 blog aggregator that has like a, a little bit of algorithmic stuff, but is primarily not. Um, and the point is that people up here don't want algorithms, right? They want browsing aids or something like that, whereas people down here don't want to do anything. Um, but I think that it's not quite one algorithm to rule them all. And Clear Channel obviously is involved in a massive captivation exercise as well, which is please listen over the change to the next hour. And like that's sort of their optimization goal. Um, oh, lethality to culture? I'm not sure. I. Uh, don't try to be a defender of culture usually in these contexts because it tends to involve uh, talking about engineers as though they don't have any. And one of the premises of this work is that they do um, and that it really matters what kind of culture they have. So we can't go and say, hey, you don't get culture because they're gonna say, okay, let's try to get culture and then they're gonna do something that you didn't like. And then what you really meant was, oh, you get culture differently from me. And as an anthropologist who's like an inveterate relativist, I'm just like, okay, this is how they get culture. People could and should probably take me to task for letting that go. Um, but I think that doing it at least one person, me doing it, is okay because it lets us see some stuff. Other people can also can you know do different kinds of taking to task. I think maybe we've run out of steam. So. Yeah, exactly. Fuck that. Play the hits. All right. Thank you so much.